This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hi everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started if you all want to take your seats. Um, just one quick housekeeping thing before we move on to our next panel. There will be a reception after um, this panel and we do hope that you will join us out in Hunter Atrium um, for that reception. Um, many of our panelists and moderators will be around to answer any questions that you may have. Our third and final panel today is called Violations and Enforcement, Identifying and Rectifying Campaign and Election Violations. And this panel will be moderated by Professor Fred Smith. Professor Smith is an associate professor at Emory University School of Law, and he is a scholar of the federal judiciary and constitutional law. Professor Smith clerked for Judge Myron Thompson of the Middle District of Alabama, Judge Barrington Parker of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and Justice Sonia Sotomayor of the U.S. Supreme Court. Prior to teaching, he worked as a fellow for the litigation boutique Bondurant, Mixon, and Elmore here in Atlanta. Professor Smith's research focuses on state sovereignty and representative government. His work has appeared in, or will appear in, the law reviews of Harvard, Stanford, Columbia, NYU, Vanderbilt, Notre Dame, and Fordham. Please join me in welcoming Professor Smith. All right, well thank you so much for being here and thank you to our wonderful uh, panelists. Um, so uh, this afternoon we're first gonna hear from Professor Takaji. Uh, so uh, Professor Daniel Takaji is the Associate Dean for Faculty uh, and he's the Charles W. Ebersold and Florence Whitcomb Ebersold, Professor of Constitutional Law uh, at The Ohio State University. Um, he is an authority on election law uh, and uh, democracy. He teaches courses on election law, constitutional law, federal court, civil procedure, and legislation. His scholarship addresses questions of voting rights, racial justice, free speech, and the role of courts in American democracy. Takaji is the author of Election Law in a Nutshell and the co-author of Election Law Cases and Materials and The New Soft Money. He has written numerous articles and book chapters on a wide variety of election and voting issues, including voter ID, voter registration, voter technology, provisional, provisional voting, redistricting, campaign finance regulation, uh, the Help America Vote Act of 2002, sorry, yes, 2002 the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, recent articles include Responding to Shelby County, a Grand Election Bargain, and Applying Section 2, the New Vote Denial. Media outlets frequently uh, seek Tataji's expertise on election and voting issues, uh, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Columbus Dispatch, and USA Today. He has appeared on uh, the Today Show, Fox News, NBC News, and NPR. A graduate of Harvard College and the Yale Law School, Takaji clerked for the Honorable Stephen Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit. Uh, before arriving at Ohio State, he was a staff attorney for the ACLU Foundation of Southern California and chair of California Common Cause. Takaji, has successfully litigated many civil rights, civil liberties, and election law cases. He was lead counsel in a case that struck down an Ohio law requiring naturalized citizens to produce a certificate of naturalization when challenged at the polls. He was an attorney for plaintiffs in cases that kept open the window for simultaneous registration and early voting in Ohio's 2008 general election, and that challenged punch card voting systems in Ohio and California after the 2000 election. Professor Takaji. Thank you so much. Uh, how long do I have? You know, so you actually, it's gonna be difficult for you to go over because we're one panelist short. Um, so there's, there's, actually, there's a fair amount of flexibility. Um, <laughs> I will, uh, that's fair. Let's, uh, let's aim for 20 minutes. I couldn't quite hear make that out, but I think the answer was 20. Give me a thumbs up in the audience if that was right. Okay, great. Um, I, I'll try to keep it to shorter than that if I can. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to be with you by video. 
I wish I could be there personally. Um, one of the, um, the responsibilities of my current job as Associate Dean for Faculty here at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law is that I actually have to attend faculty meetings. Um, but uh, even more importantly, to, to, today is my wife's birthday. And so I could not be with you personally today, but I do really appreciate the, uh, the law school and the law journal being able to accommodate my participation by video. What I'd like to speak with you all about today is the enforcement of election laws and especially laws regulating campaign finance and campaign speech. We as election lawyers and election law professors tend to pay a lot of attention to the rules, right? Rules regarding campaign finance or voter registration or how legislative districts are drawn. These are really important to be sure, but equally important are the institutions that are responsible for enforcing and otherwise implementing our laws. Because after all, if you don't have an effective means of enforcing the law, uh, the laws on the book don't mean very much at all. Now, here in the United States, if we want to talk about the enforcement of campaign finance laws, the most important and most prominent entity is the Federal Election Assistance Commission, which is responsible for the enforcement of federal campaign finance laws, though there are also lots of entities at the state and local level that are responsible for implementing campaign regulations. Here's what I'm gonna to talk to you about in the time that I have remaining this afternoon. First, I wanna to talk to you a bit about the Federal Election Commission drawing on a book chapter that I wrote, um, published in 2018 for a book called Democracy by the People about the FEC's problems and in particular its persistent problem with deadlock as well as judicial review of FEC non-enforcement decisions when the commission deadlocks. Second, I want to pan out. I want to expand to talk globally about the institutions that are responsible for uh, implementing and enforcing election laws, including campaign finance laws. This is the subject of a current paper that I have posted on SSRN entitled Comparative Election Administration to be published in a forthcoming volume on comparative election law. And then thirdly, I wanna turn back the focus to the United States and talk a little bit about the regulation of campaign speech talking especially about something that, well, a lot of people are talking about now, the proliferation of digital disinformation, as it is often called, which I'll define as knowingly or recklessly false speech that is designed to influence elections and that is disseminated through electronic means. And I'm gonna actually bracket this discussion with a, with a couple of opinions by uh, then Judge Kavanaugh, uh, or at least opinions that he was a part of while on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. Before getting to that, however, I wanna just give a little background. The United States is in some respects unusual among democracies um, in that we lack politically independent electoral institutions. Uh, the best example when it comes to election administration is at the state level where in most states, an elected secretary of state is the state's chief election official responsible for administering or at least overseeing the administration of laws regarding voting. When you talk to people from other countries, they think this is crazy. You actually have someone who is nominated as a candidate of their party running the state's elections. That's like having a referee who's the player for one of the teams. Um, at the federal level, when it comes to campaign finance laws, as I mentioned earlier, the agency responsible for the enforcement of those laws is the Federal Election Commission. Um, and in other areas as well, we often have partisans 
uh, that are responsible for enforcing laws. The, the FEC is a bipartisan agency, and I'll talk about the problems with that in just a bit. Uh, as you, you may have heard from, um, from Emmett this morning, I believe he gave the keynote address, the dominant mode of drawing districts in the United States is uh, for state legislatures to do it. And of course, when partisan elected legislators draw lines, they tend to draw them in ways that benefits themselves and their party. So this is a pervasive problem that all of us who teach and write about election law are very well, very familiar with. What I want to uh, point out is that it's due in part to the lack of politically independent and impartial electoral institutions in the United States that courts have sometimes, and you might even say often, stepped into the breach. Sometimes successfully, as with over a half century ago, the one person, one vote line of cases like Baker versus Carr, Reynolds versus Sims, that stepped in to address the problem of malapportionment, or with cases like Harper versus Virginia, which struck down again over a half century ago, the Virginia poll tax on the grounds that it discriminated against less affluent voters. Sometimes, of course, judicial intervention in elections has been much more controversial, as with, for example, the Bush versus Gore decision 20 years ago, or the Citizens United decision um, 10 years ago. For present purposes, my goal isn't to praise or condemn any of these decisions, but simply to observe that in the United States, judicial intervention in our elections arises at least in part, and I would say in no small part, from the lack of independent or impartial electoral institutions. Now let me turn to the Federal Election Commission. Um, one response to this problem, the problem and concern about agencies or other election officials enforcing the law in a biased way is to create a bipartisan agency, as has been done at the federal level and in many of the states. Um, the Federal Election Commission, responsible for enforcing federal campaign finance laws, is at least supposed to consist of six members, uh, no more than three of whom are of any one party. Uh, traditionally, we'd, we had had three Democrats and three Republicans, sometimes an independent member. The problem that we've increasingly had over the years is the problem of deadlock. It takes a majority of this bipartisan commission to take action, including enforcement action when there's been a claimed violation of campaign finance laws. And what we've seen increasingly over the years and gotten worse, especially in the last decade or so, is a stalemate, right? There, there are, there's not a majority, or at least there's not a majority of the four votes or a majority required for, um, for any position. Um, which means if, if there's not a majority, um, there is no enforcement of campaign finance laws. And the pattern that's developed in recent years, when, by the way, the problem has gotten significantly worse, is that the Republican commissioners tend to vote against in enforcement, at least in controversial cases, the Democratic commissioners for enforcement. Now, um, it's not surprising that this would happen in the hyper-polarized age that we're living in, but it creates a real problem, especially given the posture that the DC Circuit has generally taken on review. Most of these cases, almost all of them, in fact, come through the DC District Court and up to the DC Circuit. Um, and uh, the, the DC Circuit has adopted what is in effect a policy of deadlock deference as two commissioners on the FEC, Ellen Weintraub and Ann Ravel have called it. Um, this has actually gotten worse in recent years with a decision in a case called Crew versus FEC that came down in 2018 that was written by Judge Randolph and joined by then Judge Kavanaugh with Judge Pillard dissenting, which essentially held that if we've got a deadlock lock vote in the commission, but the controlling group, that is the people who voted against 
uh, enforcement cites prosecutorial discretion as a reason for their decision, it's not reviewable. Um, now, this is a problem that, that actually goes back much further, but I think this decision makes it worse. It actually stretches back way um, back to the 1980s when now Justice Ginsburg was a member of the court to an opinion she wrote, which, which has essentially led to a standard of deference to the group of commissioners voting no and therefore very little judicial review. Now, there have been proposals over the years um, to move away from this bipartisan structure that the FEC has of essentially three Democrats, three Republicans, uh, to a system in, in which one or the other major party would have effective control. I, I actually think this is a really bad idea. Um, my worry is that the agency will enforce its enforcement power and will implement its enforcement power in a partial way, targeting the opposite party and its supporters. To me, this is a cure that's worse than the disease. A better solution would be, in my view, to abandon deadlock deference and have courts more look more closely at decisions not to enforce federal campaign finance laws. Let me step back next to the second part of my presentation, provide a little bit of a global perspective on electoral institutions. Uh, this is the subject of my forthcoming book chapter on comparative election administration. As I mentioned earlier, the United States is an outlier in the extent to which party aligned and often elected officials run our elections. Uh, there's a rich body of literature, as it turns out, most of it coming from comparative politics, as well as non-governmental organizations or NGOs on the institutions that run elections around the globe, and especially on what are called election management bodies. These are agencies that administer such rules as eligibility to vote, validating nominations, operating polling places, and counting the votes. Sometimes these entities perform other tasks as well, like the drawing of district lines or the enforcement of campaign speech and finance laws. Now, the literature has broken down these election management bodies into three categories. First of all, what are called independent commissions, meaning they're independent of the political branches of government, in particular, the executive branch. Second, executive or governmental models where um, it, it, elections are run by a ministry that is under the control of the executive branch. And third, mixed models. Now, if you just heard this, you might think, well, the independent model is best. And indeed, some countries have very successful versions of the independent model, like Canada, India, and Australia. But there are also some that at least formally have independent models, like Russia, which, of course, don't have such great elections. Um, you might also think that having the executive branch run elections, the second model, is a terrible system. But if you look to a number of Western European countries like Belgium, Denmark, and Germany, you see actually they run their elections pretty well with a high degree of voter confidence. This is largely due to the fact that they have a professional civil service that is trustworthy and at least to some degree insulated from political pressure. Um, as far as the mixed systems go, well, there's good and bad there too. There are some countries that have a combination of a governmental ministry and uh, judicial or quasi-judicial entities running elections. This is sometimes referred to as the French model or a ministry and independent commission like Japan. So what I don't like about this taxonomy, the closer I looked at it, and I, I really kind of did a 180 degree flip as I was writing my last paper on this subject, is that it really suggests that formal independence is what matters. What I want to argue and have argued in this paper is that much more important than formal independence is functional impartiality, right? that the enforcing body won't favor any particular political party or faction. The best paper I've read on this subject is actually by, it's actually a doctoral dissertation by someone who is now a political science professor at Brandeis, Luis Alejandro Treyes. Um, who talks about the necessity of functional impartiality um, and, and as being more important than formal independence. This al aligns with Dean Heather Gerken's notion, um, uh, Dean 
Gerken and I, by the way, clerked for Judge Reinhardt together many years ago. Uh, she's argued that electoral institutions should be inoculated with a dose of politics. And over the years, especially since reading some of the comparative work on the subject, I've come to agree with that. Now, turning back to the United States, you might say from this perspective, the bipartisan structure of the FEC doesn't look so bad because it does inoculate um, this institution, at least from being dominated by one party or faction. But of course, the problem we have with that is stalemate and inaction and ultimately non-enforcement. I wanna turn with the remaining time I have to the problem that a lot of people are writing and talking about now, and that we're sure to hear a lot about in the current election cycle, digital disinformation, right? We saw a lot of this in the 2016 election, and we're seeing a lot of it now. Again, what I mean by this term is knowingly or recklessly false speech that is designed to influence elections and that is disseminated through electronic means. Um, a lot of it is just outright lies. Um, some of the rest of it is, well, I'm gonna quote a philosopher. Um, here's the book, if you're able to see it. <laughs> Bullshit, right? Uh, so this is this is a great book. It, it won't take you it won't take you even an hour to read if you have the time. He, Professor Frankfurt distinguishes in this short book lies and bullshit. Right, lies are intentionally false statements that are meant to mislead people about what the truth is. With bullshit, the speaker really doesn't care what's true or not. He's saying what he or she says. Um, uh, in order to, well, fool people about him or her and that person's motives. To quote Professor Frankfurt, um, what he, the bullshitter, cares about is what other people think of him, a description that seems uh, entirely apropos of our current president, even though those words weren't actually written about him. Now, there are different kinds of false and misleading speech. To give just three examples, there's false speech about candidates. We saw this back in 2016. Remember the Pizzagate allegations, this, this crazy, crazy allegation that Hillary Clinton was linked to a child sex ring. Um, there's speech that misrepresents its source. The Senate Intelligence Committee recently released a bipartisan report, a genuinely bipartisan report about Russian influence over the 2016 election. One of the things they did was to create these fake online profiles. Uh, one of the most prominent was Blacktivist, um, who, who pretended to be a Black activist, but was really trying to amplify tensions uh, within the United States. There were similar profiles created on the other side on issues like firearms. Um, the goal seems to have been, in addition to, you know, to pit Americans against one another, to try to discourage people, at least some groups of people like African Americans from voting. Uh, my friend, Professor Spencer Overton of GW has a paper that's coming out on that subject and what might be done to deal with such vote suppression efforts. A third kind of false information is false information on voting procedures, uh, including where and when to vote. Every, every election cycle, we hear these stories about you know, false information, like because of high turnout, Republicans will vote on Tuesday and Democrats on Wednesday, which of course is not true. Um, but we see this kind of information every election cycle. Now, the government has very narrow power to prohibit speech because of its falsity. Um, what's worth emphasizing here, and, and Nate Persley has pointed this out in some work that he's recently done, prohibitions on false speech are only one means of regulating or otherwise cabining it. He, he identifies what he calls the seven Ds, deletion, demotion, disclosure, delay, dilution, deterrence, and digital literacy, all of which are means 
of combating or at least cabining the influence of false or misleading speech. So I'm just going to be focusing on what can be done to prohibit or censor false speech. As I said, without getting too much into the First Amendment weeds, government's power here is really quite limited. Um, I think at the most, at least in general, when we're, when we're talking about false speech about candidates, um, the government may have the power to prohibit speech that is knowingly or recklessly false. In other words, that is lies or bullshit if it is injurious to the reputation of a candidate. That's essentially defamation. Um, as far as false speech about where and when to vote, there may actually be some more latitude. Professor Bill Marshall of the University of North Carolina Law Review has a piece coming out in the Ohio State Technology Law Journal um, where he notes that in a recent decision, Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky, a case that actually struck down an overly broad ban on political apparel at the polls, the majority opinion in footnote four actually said, we do not doubt that the states may prohibit messages intended to mislead voters about voting requirements and procedures. It's not totally clear exactly why the court thinks that would be permissible, but I would take it to be a good sign that the court apparently does think that it would be permissible. So there, there are really difficult questions about government's power to prohibit false speech. Recently here in Ohio, from which I'm speaking to you, there was a decision of the Sixth Circuit in a case called Susan B. Anthony versus Driehaus, which struck down an Ohio law prohibiting false campaign speech on the ground that it was overly broad, even though the, that law was limited to knowingly and recklessly false speech. Part of the problem that the Sixth Circuit and an opinion by Judge Cole pointed out is the enforcement mechanism. We have a commission here in Ohio, the Ohio Elections Commission, uh, which consists of three Democrats, three Republicans with the last member chosen by um, the six Democrats and Republicans collectively. I think if you're gonna create some sort of commission with the mechanism for breaking ties, this is a pretty good way of doing it, but still the Sixth Circuit thought that there were problems with the process that the Ohio Elections Commission had in place for enforcing Ohio state laws prohibition on recklessly and knowingly false campaign speech. There were also some substantive problems with the law. Now, at the federal level, there, there aren't laws that prohibit false speech, but there is a law that creates what I call an in, intersecting problem, and that is foreign contributions and expenditures. Of course, not all foreign speech is false speech and not all false speech is foreign speech, but there is, as we saw in, in the last election, a, an intersection between them. This gets me to the second opinion by then Judge Kavanaugh. This one was actually written by him, an opinion in Blumen versus FEC. The good news about this opinion is that it upheld the longstanding ban on foreign contributions and expenditures in elections on the ground that there was a democracy interest in limiting outside influence on our elections. That's the good news. The bad news is that the opinion by then Judge Kavanaugh drastically limited the existing law in order to uphold it in two respects. It seems to suggest that only monetary contributions, not in-kind contributions are prohibited, which is contrary to the plain text of the law. And it seems to limit the existing law to express advocacy and not to cover electioneering communications. I should also note that existing law covers broadcast transmissions, but it doesn't cover digitally distributed communications, which is the big problem that a lot of us are focused on nowadays. Now, there, there are bills that have been proposed. One of them is the so-called Paid Ad Act, sponsored by Senator Klobuchar, which would essentially extend the electioneering communications Ban, the ban on foreign electioneering communications to paid digital ads from foreign sources. But I want to emphasize that this too is 
um, a very limited solution to this big problem of digital in, in, in disinformation. Personally, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical the more closely I look about the prospects for regulating false speech through these kinds of prohibitory laws, even if a narrowly tailored ban could be adopted into law and were upheld by the courts, there are real serious difficulties with impartial and effective enforcement, particularly at the federal level. Now I wanna to get to the other, hand, uh, the other hand, and this is where I'll try to close on at least a somewhat optimistic note. I do think the courts and the federal courts in particular have an important role to play with respect to the onslaught of false and misleading speech in our elections and election campaigns. And I uh, take some encouragement from Chief Justice Roberts' end of year report to, uh, in 2019 on the federal courts, where he wrote, in our age when social media can instantly spread rumor and false information on a grand scale, the public's need to understand our government and the protections it provides is ever more vital. And Chief <coughs> Justice Roberts suggests that the courts might, ser might serve as a bulwark against the writing, rising tide of lies and, well, he doesn't use the word, but bullshit, in our elections. Um, and so that provides me some encouragement that courts might, uh, might help promote truth and reaffirm their commitment to truth and help us as a democracy resist the rising tide of false and misleading information. Uh, I'll stop there, but look forward to your questions and comments. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from Professor Michael Latner. Uh, who is a professor at California Polytechnic State University. Uh, professor Latner is a senior fellow at the Union of Concerned Scientists Center for Science and Democracy uh, and a professor of political science. His research has appeared in journals such as Election Law Journal, uh, Electoral Studies, and Comparative Political Studies. Dr. Latner also writes for the, uh, US, the UCS blog, The Equation, and his commentary has appeared in popular outlets, including the Washington Post's Monkey Cage and Scientific American. In 2018, the United States Supreme Court cited his co-authored book, Gerrymandering in America, The House of Representatives, uh, The Supreme Court, and the Future of Popular Sovereignty, which was published in the Cambridge University Press in 2016, um, for evidence of the magnitude of partisan gerrymandering in congressional districting. Latner is currently researching the impact of voting rights litigation on representation in California and other municipalities and the policy consequences of gerrymandering in state legislatures. Thank you, Richard. And I'd like to thank the, the law school and the law journal for uh, having me here for this very important talk. It's, it's a great group of practitioners and scholars as well. I, I'm going to, to talk today about um, gerrymandering and enforcement of political equality uh, when it comes to partisan gerrymandering primarily, uh, but I am going to take a, an integrated perspective because I, my argument is going to be that there is an opportunity to, to integrate the desperate law between racial gerrymandering and, and partisan gerrymandering, uh, and while this is certainly an uphill task, uh, there are some arguments that I want to um, present and lay out. Uh, that come from a, a social science perspective on, on the law and uh, involve the, the importance of what will ultimately be a legislative agenda before it's a, a litigated agenda. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I think that there are important contributions to make. Um, today I'm going to summarize the, the current law on partisanship, uh, vote dilution, and its relationship to, to majority rule. And so I will review uh, the, the federal case law, uh, I'm lucky enough that uh, Emmett Brondurant was able to give the first part of my lecture um, for me and did it much better than I ever could. So I'll, I'll quickly review the, the current state of the law. And then I want to propose that the, the emergent standard that we're seeing in the, in the states and uh, that we saw before the, uh, the 
Supreme Court uh, made its decision in Rucho uh, that there, there was a, a, a very clear standard that had emerged. I'm going to give it a somewhat different foundation, but the diagnostics in terms of identifying and, and remedying uh, gerrymandering, uh, we already have numerous examples of, and so I'm going to summarize uh, what those are in terms of uh, asymmetry, uh, entrenchment, and intention or causation uh, of uh, a vote dilution and an unconstitutional gerrymandering by, by state or federal standards. I then want to argue that the, the standard, that, which I call a majority rule standard, is a, an appropriate standard for, for many state constitutions. It's litigatable, um, but it's also a somewhat weak standard in the sense that it, it does not do full justice to the concept of political equality and equal protection uh, as it has been practiced. And I want to argue that uh, indeed a, a small disagreement that I have with, uh, with Emmett and maybe the only thing I've ever disagreed with him about is that I want to argue that we actually do have a right to proportional representation and that recent developments in social choice theory show that the extension of the majority rule standard, which is already well established, does indeed provide uh, and, and demand equal protection uh, and there's only one electoral system that does that, and it's proportional representation. So, as I said, uh, quickly, the, uh, the decisive statement on, in, in the Rucho case and the logic underlying it really does come from Scalia's opinion in Veep. And this is, uh, I mean, there are many more elements to this, but I think the, the most important principle and something that we certainly saw Justice Roberts carry over uh, as well as in oral argument, um, Kavanaugh's statements uh, and, and Robert's writing really uh, fundamentally rely on this concept that any kind of uh, equal protection under, or under partisan uh, gerrymandering relies on some sense of group representation or proportional representation. Scalia laid this out clearly in, in the Veith decision um, the Constitution guarantees equal protection under the law to persons, not equal representation in government or equivalently sized groups. And we see the same language come out in uh, the Rucho decision. It hardly follows, Chief Justice Roberts argues, that a principle that a person is entitled to have his political party achieve representation commensurate to its share of, of the statewide, uh, statewide support. Vote dilution in the one person, one vote cases refers to the idea that each must carry, each vote must carry equal weight. That requirement does not extend to political parties. And, and that's really the, the basis of the, the judgment and one that needs to be contested uh, because not only recent developments in, in social choice theory, um, but the emergent standard that we have seen um, coming up through the, the state courts does indeed follow this logic. And, and the way that that logic works is if we take political equality and we, we axiomatize it, that is we formally state the properties of the political equality that is an equally weighted vote holds and we look at elections as seat allocation functions. Uh, elections obviously are, are much more than that, but in the context of political equality and one person, one vote, if we consider elections a, a, a function to allocate votes in a way that converts them into seats, uh, what we find is that there are, are three major properties that we can identify that uh, any electoral system that, that meets the, the properties of, of political equality must, uh, must respect. And the, the first of those is that but the voting system must be anonymous. That is, if we change voters' names, it shouldn't change the, the result of the seat allocation. And a, a, an easy example here is to imagine that if we had a system that gave some people two votes and some people one vote, right, we switch them around, that would be a, a violation of the anonymity property. Uh, second, the Voting system, or the, the voting rule must also be neutral. Um, that is, the seat allocation rule should not discriminate between candidates or parties. And so again, if we were to switch the names of candidates or parties, uh, 
the, the vote shares and seat shares should also change as well. And if they don't, then it's violating the rule of, of neutrality. Finally, there is uh, a, the property of, of what's called non-negative responsiveness. And what that simply means is that any electoral system that uh, in the situation where some voters change their vote, a, a party that or a candidate that wins a seat should not do any worse if they get more votes. Right? If, they're, if support increases for that candidate or for that party, um, they shouldn't be punished by an increase in support. And what those three properties together bring us is the, the plurality ranking property. And, and that is basically boils down to, in, in two-party competition, that boils down to majority rule. Any electoral system that meets these properties of political equality, a majority of voters have to determine a majority of the seats in any assembly. The, um, the proofs of this are, are laid out in an election law journal that my research team and I uh, wrote in 2016, uh, uncreatively titled A Discernible and Manageable Standard for Partisan Gerrymandering. Uh, so if you're, you're interested in looking at the underlying uh, social choice theory and the, the proofs, they're there. I'm not going to bore you with them here. But the, the main point is that we do have a standard. And it is a standard that actually uh, is respected in law going quite far back in terms of uh, the respect for majority rule and the role that majority rule plays in democratic government. So a majority of voters must get at least 50% uh, of the seats. And, and the important point here is that there is, there's no reference to, to group rights, as, as Scalia was so uh, critical of. There's no reference to proportional representation. The, the justification here and the logic follows simply from the equally weighted votes of individuals. And as the Equal Protection Clause applies to individuals, not, group, uh, not groups, it, it meets those standards. If we look at the diagnostics as to how do we identify and, and rectify a, a, a vote dilution uh, case, in this case a violation of political equality, um, partisan symmetry has emerged as uh, the defining feature uh, in, in many of the cases that, that um, came up through the, the state courts over the last few years. And what partisan symmetry simply means is that for any given vote share, what do the, the voters of one party get in terms of their percentage of seats relative to another party? And there are numerous ways of, of measuring this. Uh, there's the, the Gelman-King symmetry measure, which I rely on, and I'll, I'll explain uh, in a second why I think that's uh, the best measure. Uh, as these case, cases were coming up into the Supreme Court, political scientists didn't make a lot of noise about uh, and fighting over which measures were better, in part because we just wanted Kennedy to pick one and get it over with, and uh, that ended up not happening, so now we can talk a little bit about which measures are best. Uh, but the symmetry standard ensures that a majority of voters can elect a uh, majority of representatives, ensuring that all voters are equally protected. Um, the symmetry uh, metric um, has received positive feedback in both the VEATH and the Lulock cases, uh, the opinions uh, argued, uh, Kennedy argued it was a helpful, though certainly not talismanic tool. Uh, and importantly, asymmetry alone, the justices argued, is not a, a reliable measure of unconstitutional partisanship uh, on its face. While that's um, debatable, the, the, the case laws that emerge and the strategies, the litigation strategies that have emerged include something that looks much more like a, a three-prong test. Um, certainly, Common Cause, uh, B. Lewis is, is replicating this as well. And you saw this in a lot of the uh, amicus briefs in, in both of the, the federal cases. And we're seeing uh, a, a similar set of diagnostics emerging that, that clearly point to a, a standard that has emerged for partisan gerrymandering. Uh, it, most of these come in the form, uh, are being drawn legally uh, from protections under the 14th Amendment and equal protection, though, as uh, Professor uh, Takaji's work has shown, I think that there, there are numerous reasons why associational rights and First Amendment protections um, should probably be incorporated as well. Um, my point is whether one is working from uh, an equal protection 
uh, or a, a First Amendment position, the, the equal protection element is essential because that's where we uh, have the foundation of the one person, the one vote rule. Uh, and just to, to illustrate um, why partisan symmetry can work, the, the symmetry measure is itself a statewide standard, right? So it looks at all the votes in the various districts and it looks at the share of seats that are won in the aggregate statewide. Um, that became a, uh, an element of, of criticism when um, the Gill uh, Whitford case was sent back and, and there was uh, some discussion from Justice Roberts that you know, this is a, a district level problem. It needs to, any evidence, any diagnostic needs to work at the district level. And, and indeed, symmetry can be explored at the district level. This is one example from Common Cause v. Lewis, one of the uh, plaintiff's exhibits, that shows that you can go to the district level and you can demonstrate where the cracking and packing is happening, right? So, so the, the metric itself is statewide, but you can certainly demonstrate it in the same way uh, that we traditionally demonstrate cracking and packing in racial discrimination cases as well. Um, I would also add that it should have been very clear um, to the justices that the measure of symmetry is not a measure of proportional representation. And, and here there are some differences between the different diagnostic tools that are used. So the efficiency gap um, does incorporate some proportionality into it. Uh, but the, the Gelman and King measure, the, the oldest measure that has the most peer-reviewed and most um, court uh, case, cases cited using it, very clearly partitions out what we will call partisan bias, that is the, the uh, asymmetry that is caused by the drawing of district boundaries as opposed to the rest of the disproportionality that happens in a winner-take-all district, which we refer to as responsiveness. And responsiveness is simply how, uh, what is the share of seat change that you get from a one percentage change in vote share from one party to another in two party competition. And, and to demonstrate this, uh, Stephen Wolf at, at Daily Coast, uh, uh, who's a very good mapper and uh, we've worked together on uh, some districting maps to make this sort of example clear, this is a hypothetical gerrymander of Maryland uh, the, the Maryland case, the, the Benesek case, uh, the, the charge was that Republicans had had one seat stolen away from them. Um, what this map demonstrates is that Democrats could have gone further. They could have actually eliminated Republican representation with a map that, it, as you can see, uh, it, the, the districts basically start around the Baltimore area and then they creep into the more rural Republican areas, kind of like slices of pizza. So you might call this a pizza mander. Uh, I'd like to copyright that if there's any copyright attorneys available. Um, but it also uh, corresponds to what Bernard Groffman has referred to as a dummy mander. And the reason that it's been called a, a dummy mander is what the majority party is doing or the ruling party is that they're stretching their majorities out quite thin, right, in terms of the, uh, the safety of the districts. And so a, a, a statewide vote swing could be very punitive and could backfire if you stretch out your, um, your voters too thin. Nevertheless, this, fair, this plan right here by the Gelman and King symmetry measure, if we, we look down to the, um, the table here, we have the bias measures, the responsiveness measure, and the overall disproportionality of, of various plans, including the, the pre-2012 plan, which as you can see, the, the bias was quite high already in the pre-2012 plan. Indeed, higher than it was in the plan that was, uh, that the suit came under. And, and that's because there were, uh, the, the districts were safer for, for Democrats, uh, but it was a very unresponsive plan. So you can see that there's virtually no responsive, it's almost a one-to-one -one, um, correspondence um, with a moderate level of disproportionality. Under the, the, the plan in, in the, the sixth district where the lawsuit came from, um, you saw a significant level of partisan bias, right? So that, that 14, there's a, a 14 percentage point seat advantage for the districting party, for an equal vote share uh, between Republicans and Democrats. Um, you can also see that it's somewhat more responsive, right? So what Democrats did in this is they, they moved their voters around a little bit. They, they actually made some of the districts more 
competitive, but they also assured themselves that they could capture that additional seat. And, and as a result, you see much higher disproportionality. The, the maximum democratic gerrymander, as you can see, by the Gelman and King measure, is a fair plan, right? It, the bias is actually slightly negative, and it's highly responsive. And so what that means is, is that under the, the Gelman-King measure of symmetry, if Republicans, Demo, uh, Maryland's a fairly democratic state, but if Republicans were to win a majority of the vote, they would also win a majority of the seats under this dummy mander, right, or the, the pizza mander. Uh, and that's why it's a, it's a risky thing for the ruling party to be spreading itself so thin. But as you can see, it's very disproportionate, right? So it's not a proportional plan at all, but it's a fair plan using this diagnostic. And so the, the court was simply wrong in associating uh, all these symmetry measures with uh, some attempt at getting um, proportional representation. Uh, a, a fair plan that was also drawn um, shows that you can create uh, basically a, a, a two seat, something more or less like the old plan that would have given Republicans two seats and uh, Democrats the other eight. Uh, it wouldn't have been biased, it would have been moderately responsive and again, some moderate level of disproportionality. I'll come back to that PR measure in just a second. So what does this look like diagnostically? Well, symmetry obviously is, is a central measure. Again, the Garofman and King measure um, partitions out bias and responsiveness from disproportionality. And one can think of it in the, the same way that the, the first prong of the, the Gingles test is, is applied. That is, you're, you're looking for a, uh, a, 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 an aggregation of, of voters um, where you, you could find a, a district that they could be represented in. And, and that's sort of what asymmetry is looking at, right? It's looking for the punishment that one party is receiving um, at the hand of a gerrymandering party. Second, most of these diagnostics include something more, something to demonstrate not just how much bias there is, but how durable is the gerrymander? Because of even a plan that's very biased, again, like the, the all Democrat plan, uh, it might be very unfair. Most Republicans would certainly think so, but that sort of a plan is not durable. That is, with a significant enough vote swing, uh, it would flip the, the districts to the other party. And so you want to be able to demonstrate how entrenched the ruling party is. And indeed, in many cases, uh, in uh, Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin, you're looking at cases where um, the, the punished party is winning a majority of votes, often in the state. Um, but the, the gerrymander is so durable that in, in the case of Wisconsin, the uh, gerrymandering party is able to almost hold on to a supermajority of seats in the state legislature. Um, finally, and, and I'm quite sympathetic to Professor Simpson's view on, on this, uh, but intent or causation has certainly emerged as, as sort of the, the third prong. Um, whereas entrenchment looks at uh, essentially the, the level of polarization and how durable that is, because if, if there's a lot of vote swing, right, or if there's a lot of crossover voting between parties, it's not gonna be a, a durable plan. Uh, what intention does is that it, it demonstrates that there is a remedy, right? And, and there's a couple of ways of doing this, if we, as we've seen already earlier today, uh, and in the, the keynote talk in the, the Common Cause Lewis case, they're using simulations, right, of alternative maps to show how far or how much of a deviation the adopted plan is from a sample of simulated plans. Um, that's one way to do it. I, I would argue that one map that's fair, that demonstrates that uh, the adopted plan or the adopters of the gerrymandered plan could have chosen an alternative is enough because it shows, it demonstrates that the choice for the adopted plan was a political choice and was a partisan choice. So where do we go in terms of enforcement? Well, uh, there are 30 states that already protect um, free elections or have some sort of free and fair uh, election clause. Uh, North Carolina, uh, the, the, the claim of the, the plaintiffs is, is, uh, goes back to actually um, pre-American law to the, the English Constitution, 
uh, that the origin of free and fair elections is an old one. It's been recognized for centuries. And the basic claim is that where a party has manipulated the electoral process to ensure it remains in control of the government, elections are, are not free. Um, I think that that is the, the anchor for future litigation at the state level and also for a future legislative agenda because uh, as Mr. Bondurant pointed out to me uh, in discussion at lunch, those 30 states are the states where it's probably not needed the most, right? So the, the states that are most in need of relief um, do not have these sorts of clauses and uh, that then becomes a, a legislative agenda to, to pass that kind of legislation at the, the state level. Um, some other enforcement mechanisms. Um, my research team and I, we're, we're currently working on a, a book on gerrymandering in the state legislatures. And we have shown that free, uh, that fair districting criteria, generally speaking, compactness requirements and the like, tend to not be much of, uh, of a, a barrier to, to gerrymandering. Um, they don't tend to work. Uh, and, and for fairly obvious reasons, certainly in the case of compactness, um, compactness requirements really don't tell you anything about the fairness of a plan. Uh, what does work is determining who has control over the districting process. And so our research has shown that uh, when we look at the, the, the pre and post 2011 maps, uh, which was arguably the, the second or third worst gerrymandering in the nation's history, um, we find striking outcomes, uh, not surprisingly, determining, uh, uh, depending on who controls the districting process. And we specifically find that independent redistricting commissions do work. Um, their, their, their plans are significantly less biased uh, as long as they have teeth. They're truly independent. They don't necessarily need to be nonpartisan. I'm not sure exactly what that even means, but bipartisan and, and independent and a, and a degree of functional independence, uh, I think, is, is crucial here. Um, but of course, politicians are going to resist this. Uh, politicians, uh, both parties resisted the establishment of a commission in California. And as we know from 2018, uh, the states of Michigan and Missouri passed comprehensive voting rights reforms, including uh, independent redistricting. And they are uh, the parties there, the legislatures are fighting it in court um, today. So with regard to the the strength of this standard, the majority rule standard, there are a couple of, of problems with it. Um, number one, uh, the majority rule standard can be applied quite narrowly. That is, uh, it may only be applicable in competitive state legislatures, in competitive states. Uh, in other words, Republicans in Massachusetts, Democrats in Utah, um, could very well be the victims of vote dilution through partisan gerrymandering, but not, might not find relief in to the extent that there's, there's no realistic opportunity that um, the minority party is going to be the majority anytime soon. Um, in addition, it's increasingly difficult to draw uh, fair plans in some states. Uh, we saw this with Nate Persilli's Pennsylvania map. The, the map that was eventually adopted um, was much less compact than some of the, the alternatives. And the reason for that was because voting rights were put first uh, over other criteria. Uh, districting criteria. Um, similarly, in Illinois, people look at the map in Illinois and they think, oh goodness, that's a, a gerrymander. Um, Chewy Garcia's district, for example, in Chicago looks like a pair of earmuffs. And I, I promised I wasn't going to show any funny gerrymanders because I've stopped doing that. It gets old. Um, but the, the point is that Illinois is actually not a gerrymandered state at all. It's, it's what the governing party in the legislature had to do to get a fair map. And so the, the Illinois map actually treats both parties fairly. Um, but I think even more importantly, um, if we, we buy the logic of one person, one vote, the majority rule standard does justice to equal protection, but it doesn't do full justice to equal protection. And so if we want to extend the Constitution's reach to full political equality, we need to recognize that disproportionality is itself a form of vote dilution. And, and we do this using the same logic of the one person, one vote principle, using the same logic and the same mathematics underlying the, the demonstration that political equality requires majority rule. All we do is extend the logic to the coalitions that make up government. So if we abandon the assumption of two party, uh, two party competition, and we focus instead on the coalitions that actually make up legislative majorities, again, there is only one election rule that respects political equality, 
and gives every voter an equal opportunity to determine the coalitions that can carry legislation in a legislature, and that's proportional representation, pure proportional representation, where everyone's vote actually has a, a truly equal weight. Now, no system, whether it's winner take all or any of the existing proportional systems, can guarantee proportional representation perfectly or can even guarantee majority rule. But knowing what we know now about the, the link between individual voting rights and the composition of legislatures, uh, we certainly can do better. And we can rely on the law that's already been established, including Reynolds v. Sims, that basically lays out the same logic that it shouldn't matter where a voter lives, it shouldn't matter what the orientation or race is of the voter, their vote should have equal weight. And there's only one electoral system that does that, and it's proportional representation. Um, the framers certainly understood the link between proportionality, its political power, and, and the influence on the composition of legislatures. Uh, we look at the House apportionment rules, uh, the, the great compromise uh, that was made in terms of allowing southern states to get more proportional representation based on slave populations. Uh, throughout the 19th century, and as uh, Professor Lang's work uh, indicates, um, gerrymandering is as old as the Republic, and politicians have themselves been wary of its use, and wary of its use uh, particularly with the implementation of single-member districts. Um, that has been fairly brief in, in American history. Um, the norm of single seat districts uh, is, is a relatively recent uh, invention, the, the late 1800s. Um, before that, uh, many states, including Georgia, elected all of their members at large. Um, Georgia actually used a post system, but still elected all their members at large. And so we shouldn't be holding up the status quo as any kind of a, a compelling interest. Uh, and I, I will conclude um, by simply demonstrating what a, a PR system could get you. Again, this is the state of Maryland, and if we divide the state into to two multi-member districts, what you end up getting is better minority representation, in this case, Republican representation, than you would under any of the alternatives. So using um, current congressional election uh, statistics and presidential voting statistics, um, we show that on, on average, that type of a plan, two districts, a, a five district plan, for District 1, the more populous area of the state, and a three-district plan uh, in the second district would actually give you three Republican representatives and five Democratic representatives on average. And uh, more importantly, the, um, the type of representation you get doesn't require segregating communities so that you're amplifying or e uh, equalizing their voting power. And it, it doesn't matter what the uh, what the uh, motivation is for the voter, whether it's partisan, whether it's racial identity, or what the case uh, may be. So how do we do that? Well, that's, a, again, a legislative agenda. Um, we're starting to see it already. Uh, one of the things that's very clear in the light of not just the gerrymandering cases, but many of the other voting rights controversies um, that we've discussed today is that we are entering an era of reform. Um, we're seeing it across the states. We're seeing it not just in the, the proliferation of um, the ranked choice voting models in, in Maine and in numerous cities across the United States, uh, but there are wider varieties of proportional electoral systems. East Point, Michigan just adopted the single transferable vote, which is a proportional system uh, uh, in response to a Voting Rights Act claim. And so uh, I would argue that we are already in the beginnings of uh, an era of reform probably unlike anything we've seen in the last 100 years. Um, the progressive era was the last area where, uh, last era that we implemented a lot of institutional reforms, not all of them good, and so I'll, I'll leave you with that last warning um, that as we enter this era of reform, uh, be wary of good government types arguing for their favorite reforms um, because they're not all proportional, they don't all look after racial voting rights the same, uh, and we have to put voting rights first. And we should not make the same mistake that we made in the progressive era and other eras of reform. But with your help, with the help of voting rights attorneys, um, we can make this a, a much better era of reform. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um,
So I'm going to ask one question each, and then open it up to the uh, the audience for questions. <clears throat> so uh, my question for uh, for Professor Takaji is a. I know you said you. Could you? I'm sorry. I'm having. You're coming in sure. really muffled. I, I I could hear Michael just fine, but I'm really having a hard time hearing you. If you could move to where he was, that would help me. I will. Um, so I, I know that you said you didn't want to talk about the First Amendment necessarily, or um, but I, I can't help. But ask I didn't a, want to get into the weeds. Right. Um, you want to. But, but in light of the fact that your remarks were so much about um, the yeah. falsity of speech and, uh, and interventions, and you cite to um, yeah. the Susan B. Anthony case in Ohio, um, do you have any discomfort, though, about a, the government uh, essentially creating uh, commissions to determine whether or not uh, statements are true or, or false in the political context? And um, is it that you don't think that this type of speech should be, that false speech or misleading speech, you know, do you not think that it should be protected at all? Or is it your view that it should be protected but that there are sufficient uh, countervailing, compelling interests um, that yeah. should cause us yeah. to intervene? It's, it's, a, it's a great question and I, I appreciate your asking it. So look, I'm a former ACLU attorney. I have litigated a lot of free speech cases. Um, and so yes, when the government takes steps to restrict speech and especially restrict speech based on content, um, I do get nervous. That said, there are well-established categories of speech that, if not entirely outside the First Amendment, are at least subject to some degree of regulation and even prohibition. And one of those established categories of speech is defamation. When we're talking about public officials and uh, public figures, the standard from New York Times versus Sullivan is that you have to prove actual malice uh, for either civil or criminal penalties, which means showing that the speech is either knowingly false or made with reckless disregard of its truth or falsity. And knowingly false is, of course, a lie. Um, I think that speech that's made with reckless disregard of its truth or falsity is a, is a good description of what I earlier characterized as bullshit. Um, and, and so um, I, I am, um, I, I am uh, okay with um, a narrowly drawn law that targets recklessly or knowingly false speech. And, and I am okay so long as there's some provision for judicial review and prompt determinations uh, with some kind of administrative agency. And, and personally, I, I like the one that we have in Ohio, the Ohio Elections Commission, being charged with at least initial responsibility. Again, so long as that initial determination is subject to judicial review to make sure that freedom of speech rights are protected. So it's a long-winded answer. Yes, I'm concerned. But I, but I am okay with some degree of content-based regulation when it comes to knowingly and recklessly false speech disseminated about a candidate for public office. Thank you. And uh, my, my question for you um, is about the idea that at one person, one vote kind of naturally, conceptually leads to the idea that um, the party that receives the most votes should receive the most seats. Um, isn't it the case that that sort of assumes a great deal uh, of partisanship on the part of voters in a way that's kind of, that may be fairly accurate now, but that's not always locked in? That is to say, what about the voter who supports a person who happens to be a Democrat in one district, but would absolutely not support a person who happens to be a Democrat um, who's running in another district, um, and how how would that in, in a you know in a in a world imagine you know the 1960s when the parties were more even? Um, how would your uh, reforms map onto those sorts of historical moments? It's a, a great question. So the, the the institutional fact that the the theory relies on is that um, even if that is the case, and and people have very different motivations for supporting one party over another, 
the, the institutional fact of legislators is that parties are not like other organizations, right? Parties are what organize legislatures. Parties control the committee assignments, the, the voting procedures um, in, in a legislature. And so uh, I believe, uh, I think in Veith, Scalia mentioned something that, you know, we don't have special protections for farmers or, or milkmen, but, but parties aren't like that, right? Parties aren't like other groups. And so the, the strength of this argument relies on the assumption that we look, we, we see that, that parties are an integral part of the electoral and the legislative process in a way that other groups and organizations are not. And that therefore, any inequalities in terms of, of punishment over who can get a majority to pass a bill, right, that impinges on the voter's individual rights in a, in a way that, and, and so to, to demonstrate that, you have to, um, you have to show that, uh, that the House of Representatives, for example, um, was thought about in this way, right? That the, uh, the, the House was designed to represent the people of the United States, not the peoples of the United States, and that there was intended to be a direct correspondence between the strength of individual votes and the coalitions that have the strength to pass legislation in the legislature. Okay, thanks. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Dan, it's Brian Sells. I have a question for hey, you Brian. Uh, aimed specifically at the comparative portion of your talk. Earlier today, we had a fantastic panel on state and local uh, election law and advances there. I'm wondering, in, in your research, have you looked at uh, what states and localities are doing in terms of uh, enforcement of campaign finance law that might shed yeah. light on your views of what is the best model? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and I have not looked at this as, as deeply as I would like to and, uh, and think we should look at. Um, I've, I've looked more carefully at what states have done in the realm of uh, redistricting. Um, and, and I'm sure there's some work out there that I haven't read, but I, I appreciate the point, Brian, that it's really important for us to look more carefully and to take a deeper dive into the efficacy of state and local level institutions than we have to date. And so I, I take that as a great suggestion for further research in this area. You know, most of us who teach election law, um, we, we tend to focus not exclusively, but mainly on what's happening at the federal level. But it's a great reminder for us that uh, what's happening at the state and, and local level is often at least as important and that state and local government entities can serve as laboratories for democracy. So I, I appreciate the, what I'll take to be a suggestion for, for my work and that of others. Are there any other questions? Richard Berfold, this is uh, for Michael. Um, so maybe I am uh, boiling your argument down, which your very sophisticated and nuanced argument down to its essence. But are you basically saying that single member districts are unconstitutional? No, not at all. Uh, and there are... Uh, or so let me rephrase it. Is it possible to have a system of single member districts that also provides proportional representation? Oh, sure. And I think if you, you look at the work of Tom Brunell and some others, they essentially make this argument, right? That they, they so there's a, a, a small literature in political science that argues that we want the least competitive districts possible, right? We don't want competitive districts. We want districts that are 80% um, partisan or and the reason being that one, everyone's gonna be happy with their legislator, but two, you actually end up aggregating to a proportional system at the, the state or the, the federal level. So uh, my argument is not that, that single member districts should ever be considered unconstitutional. Indeed, uh, the major result of the Voting Rights Act was that we found something that worked, right? So, uh, and, and this is very much a, a, a current case a problem in California, right? California, the California Voting Rights Act doesn't have the compactness requirements of the, the federal act, and so hundreds of cities are being sued 
and they're being told that they have to move to district elections because um, their city's 30% Latino and they don't elect any Latinos. Uh, and, and moreover, the, the law provides safe harbor if you just adopt a district system. And, and that, I think, is a real problem because you now have um, suits where you're, you're designing districts that are 15, 20% Latino. There isn't much evidence that there's any racially, racially polarized voting in the first place. And even if there is, especially if there is, a district system's not going to help. It's actually going to, to crack the racial voting coalitions and it's going to hurt those voters. So that, that's, that's the, the caveat I would say. I think if, if single member districts work and they, they can work fine, use them. They're a good remedy. But increasingly, I think as, as we don't see the kind of segregation that, that characterized the South where that remedy was, was created and we're applying it in different contexts, it's not going to work as well. We have time for one more question. This is uh, for Professor uh, Latner. Uh, my name is Connor Hayes. I'm at 2L at Emory and on the Emory Law Journal. You pointed out that one of the weaknesses of relying on the majority rule standard may be that it doesn't help out uh, Republicans in Massachusetts or Democrats in Utah, but couldn't it be seen as more than just not helping them out and kind of being a recipe for the way that you do vote dilution in the future, meaning that it's not applied narrowly in the sense of just saying, oh, okay, in these situations, we're not going to uh, rule on the claim. Ultimately, if you're dealing with a sense of majority rule of a majority of the votes are still for Republicans in Utah, and they move it from instead of seven to six or eight five to a 10-3, why under that principle would that not just be allowed in every sense and that the new type of vote dilution is to push it as far as you can in the majority's favor? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that that's an important question. And, and one could see the, the majority rule standard being applied quite narrowly or more broadly, right? So you, you, a broader application of the majority rule standard would still, you'd still be able to show if there's a one seat discrepancy and it's a reliable and durable one seat discrepancy, I think you could still make the case. Um, but I, but the, the standard is most clear when the, the minority party actually has a realistic probability of, of obtaining control over the legislature. But you're absolutely right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we're now going uh, to have an introduction of the dean. Is that the next? Thanks. I'm going to actually uh, sign off. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you so much to Professor Smith, Professor Latner, and Professor Takaji uh, for joining us for this uh, final panel. Um, it is now my honor to introduce Dean Marianne Babinski, Dean of the Emory Law School. Dean Babinski joined us at the beginning of the school year from the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. Dean Babinski's areas of research have included health law, biotechnology, and bioethics. The Emory Law School is so fortunate to have an incredible scholar and leader among our ranks. Please join me in welcoming Dean Babinski. Well, thank you for that introduction. And I have um, a keen awareness of the fact that I'm standing between you and what looks like a fantastic reception just outside these doors. Uh, but I did want to take a moment to um, just reflect and give gratitude uh, for the opportunity that we've had uh, to have yet another fantastic Randolph W. Thrower Symposium. As people would hear, this has been the, this is the 39th symposium. If you look back over time and see the challenging topics uh, and important issues that have been discussed in this symposium, you'd know that this year it was another uh, fine example um, of what this symposium has done over time to create a moment to bring together uh, legal scholars, practitioners, members of the public uh, to talk about a key issue of importance to our society. Uh, and we're so grateful to have had the opportunity to do that on such an important and timely topic for our country. 
uh, for the average person, you know, for me uh, and, and my family and, and um, as a, uh, in our, my community, uh, we always talk about voting being the foundation of our democracy. But to have the opportunity to look at what that actually means in terms of uh, who is it that's voting, how are they voting, what's the impact of that vote, and to look at the different roles that uh, members of the public, legislature, uh, and the courts uh, have played in actually defining and ensuring that the promise of voting is a reality for as many people as possible in our country uh, has really been a special aspect of this uh, symposium. Uh, and so I want to uh, take the opportunity to thank various people. As I began with, I want to thank the Thrower family uh, and the Thrower committee, which is my understanding uh, has uh, worked very hard over the years to support the Law Journal in selecting uh, and in carrying out uh, the symposium, making sure that we have the the best topics and the, and the most important speakers. So Patricia Barmeyer, Wilson Barmeyer, uh, and the Honorable Frank uh, Hall. Uh, I wanted to obviously thank you as our attendees, the keynote speaker, Emmett Bondran, uh, and the panelists, uh, some of whom I had a chance to learn from as I was standing in the back of the room, uh, and our moderators who I always learn from, uh, Professor uh, Smith and others. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, staff members who helped, uh, Rhonda Yermans, um, Dania Duran, and uh, Amy Marshallana, uh, without whom the symposium wouldn't be possible, and the Emory Law Journals, uh, Rashmi uh, Bora, uh, the executive symposium editor, uh, William Carlucci, uh, and the symposium editors, Alex Landgraf and Alex Capelli, uh, and all of the 2L staff members, many of whom I believe are here today. Uh, so uh, thank you for hav having made this event possible. Thanks to the speakers, the panelists, uh, and the moderators. Uh, and I suppose I should say, by way of transition, thanks to all those who made the food that we are now going to enjoy uh, together. So thank you all. <laughs>